talks about uh, like two interesting problems in the field of structural graph theory. Uh, he's going to talk about the intersection of uh, Birkhoff von Neumann graphs and uh, those uh, something called as PM compact graphs. Uh, so yeah, I'll let like Nishad explain like this. It's his work. Yeah. So, okay. okay. Thanks a lot, Sharad, for the introduction and for the invitation. And uh, thanks to everyone for joining in. So it's actually really nice to be giving my first talk as assistant professor at the University of Waterloo, while unfortunately not being there really. Um, but that's fine. I've been wanting to come for a long time. So at least now I can be there virtually. So that's a good start. Thanks. So I hope you all can hear me clearly, but if at any point you don't hear me clearly, just uh, interrupt me and let me know. Okay, so I'll be talking about two unsolved problems, Birkhoff von Neumann graphs and PM compact graphs. Um, so my original plan was to cover two results, but chances are high that I will only cover one result, the one which is more recent, and the one which is actually the intersection of these two problems, as shown in this end. So I may not cover the other result, which is from 2017. I'll focus on this one, the more recent one. Okay, so both problems are motivated by uh, the perfect matching polytope, uh, an object very well studied in polyhedral combinatorics. So let's start with the perfect matching, which is the object of interest in almost any talk I give. So here is a graph, G, uh, it is a triangular prism, which we generally abbreviate as the complement of a six cycle. And what you see here are these three red colored edges. They form a perfect matching. So what's a perfect matching? I'm pretty sure you all know it. Let's just uh, define it. If you look at any vertex and the edges incident at it, you will see exactly one red colored edge incident at the vertex. Such a, con such a set of edges, the red edges in this case, is a perfect matching of the graph. Okay, so here you, you see one perfect matching of the graph. By symmetry, you can find three other perfect matchings of this graph. You take one edge from the triangle, each triangle, and one edge from the three edges going between the triangles. Okay, so that gives you three perfect matchings in this graph. And there is a fourth perfect matching in this graph, which is the green colored edges. Okay. So this graph has four perfect matchings. Okay, let me erase the green one now. So with any perfect matching, you may associate a vector with it. Um, so I could put ones on the edges that are in my perfect matching, and I would put zeros everywhere else. Okay, so you get a zero one vector um, in the dimensions, the number of edges of the graph. So each perfect matching may be viewed as a zero one vector. And then you may take the convex hull of these vectors and that gives you the perfect matching polytope. So just the definition, perfect matching. Let's see. Sorry, these scratches are a bit annoying. Yeah, this is a bit annoying. Let's see. You might so I'm going want to use to this notation. Try yeah. the put some piece of small plot. Yeah. Right. Let me do that because I wasn't getting these many scratches in my rehearsal with my friend. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me put a piece of plot here. Okay. Okay, so that's my notation for the perfect matching polytope of a graph. Okay, so it's a convex hull of all perfect matchings where you view each perfect matching as a vector. Okay, and then a natural question to ask is given a vector in the right dimensions, under what conditions can you say that it belongs to the polytope? So if I give you a vector, then when can you say that this vector belongs to the polytope? 
Yeah, this is much better. Good. Thanks. Um, so you're looking for a linear inequality description for this polytope, which of course, being a combinatorial optimization person, you're very interested in. You would like to have a succinct description of this polytope using linear inequalities, right? So let's look at some obvious necessary conditions. Well, these vectors are zero one vectors. So you take convex combinations, clearly you're gonna get non-negative vectors, right? So in particular, for each edge of the graph, you're going to have the component being at least zero. Okay, that's very straightforward. Let's look at another somewhat straightforward condition that comes directly from the definition of perfect matchings. If you look at any vertex and you take the sum over the edges incident at that vertex of the X values, you get exactly one, right? By definition of perfect matching. And so in any convex combination, this is still going to be true. For every vertex of the graph, If you take the sum of all the edges incident at that vertex, so that's my notation for edges incident at a vertex V. If you take the sum, it's going to be equal to one. Yeah. So we're going to call these non-negativity constraints and degree constraints. Okay. So all right, so these are obvious necessary conditions that just come from the definition of a perfect matching. Are these conditions sufficient? Can someone give me an example of a graph and a vector that shows that these conditions are not sufficient? Just a triangle. Just a triangle? Yeah. Or would you rather use the graph that is already drawn? Yeah. Okay. The graph that's already there. <laughs> okay, okay. So let's use the graph that's already there. So I save some space here. Can you suggest the vector now? Let's see. Sharad already gave the hint, the triangle. So maybe you use the triangles of the graph. Put, uh, put halves on the edges of the triangles. Yes. Hmm. Exactly. So <laughs> let's do exactly that. Let's put halves on the edges of the triangles and zeros everywhere else. So I'm going to put a half on these three and these three edges. And I'm going to put a zero everywhere else. Right? So this vector clearly satisfies the constraints on the right hand side, non negative 10 degree constraints. Is it in the polytope? And if it is not, then why is it not? Can we find a short explanation for why it is not in the polytope? Anyone? Well, when you're discussing the, the different perfect matchings that exist, there's always one that one edge that goes from one triangle to the other triangle. Right. Thanks. Thank you. So when you look at the cut, we, we saw the four perfect matchings of this graph. And in particular, all of those four perfect matchings have to use one of the three edges in this cut because there's an odd number of vertices on each side of the cut, right? So in each perfect matching, you're going to have at least one edge. And when you take convex combinations, the sum should be at least one over these three edges. And so therefore, this vector cannot be expressed as a convex combination of perfect matching vectors. OK, good. All right. So these conditions, in general, are not necessary and sufficient. However, as some of you already know, they are actually necessary and sufficient for bipartite graphs. So in the case of bipartite, oops, not that, um, that, and that. Okay. So in the case of, in the case of bipartite graphs, this is actually necessary and sufficient, but not for all graphs. Uh, and this is due to independent results of Birkhoff and von Neumann from 1950s and 60s, I think. I think I have 50s actually. Okay. So for bipartite graphs, it's necessary and sufficient. Uh, but it turns out that there are other graphs for which also they could be necessary and sufficient. One example is K4. Or you could take any wheel. You take any odd cycle 
and put a universal vertex in the middle, joining it to all the vertices. That's an odd wheel, because this, you start with an odd cycle. So all the odd wheels are an example of Birkhoff von Neumann graphs. So from now on, Birkhoff von Neumann graphs are going to be those graphs for which these conditions are necessary and sufficient. Okay, so Birkhoff von Neumann graphs. Are those graphs for which these conditions, I mean non negativity and degree constraints, are necessary and sufficient? Okay, in particular, all bipartite graphs are Birkhoff von Neumann. But there are other graphs that are not bipartite that are also more couple like the odd wheels. Okay. And so that brings us to our first problem. And let me actually just erase the entire screen here. Our first problem is to characterize the Birkhoff von Neumann graph. So what I mean by that is if you look at the decision problem, say if I give you a graph G, I want you to decide whether it is Birkhoff von Neumann or not. Then is that decision problem, is it in NP? Is it in ONP? And finally, Holy Grail, is it in P? Okay, is the first problem clear? Good. So in particular, the triangular prism that we just saw on the previous slide, the complement of a six cycle, it is not a Birkhoff von Neumann graph. All bipartite graphs, all odd wheels are Birkhoff von Neumann. Okay, good. So turns out two of these three problems are open. Clearly the P is open and uh, one of the other two is also open. Okay. Good. So it turns out, uh, so, so let's try to generalize the previous example. So in the previous example, we had uh, these two triangles. And somehow using these two triangles and some other property, which is not so immediate in this graph, because it's a very small graph, we were able to construct the vector. The vector that showed that the graph is not Birkhoff von Neumann, right? Let's try to generalize this idea. Supposing I give you a graph G. So now we are going to, supposing I have a graph G and I tell you that the graph has, oh, okay. Mm, before I go there, let me just mention one important point. Uh, I'll come back to this discussion in a second. So, okay, so there is one important point I want to mention, which is the following. And if you have been to some of my talks, then you know where I'm going. So in any graph, if there is an edge that is not in a perfect matching, then it's going to be zero in all perfect matching vectors. So in any convex combination, that edge, the corresponding component will always be zero. These edges are uninteresting. They don't contribute anything to the problem. So what you could do, let me give you an example to make it clear. Supposing this is my graph. Okay, here there is one edge that is not in any perfect matching. It's this edge. Okay, this edge does not contribute to the perfect matching polytope. It's always zero in all perfect matchings. And so in any convex combination zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw away this edge and I shouldn't have thrown away more than that. So let me draw that again. So I threw away one edge and I got two smaller graphs. These, these are the connected components. They have the property that every edge belongs to some perfect matching. So it turns out that in many problems in matching theory, including the two problems I'm discussing today, you may restrict yourself to connected graphs in which every edge is in a perfect matching. If you solve the problem for these graphs, you solve the problem for all graphs. Okay. And I will leave that as an exercise. You can think about it later. 
it requires some minor tricks here and there, but in general, this is true for almost all problems involving perfect matching of a graph, right? So from now on, I'm going to assume that all of our graphs are connected and each edge belongs to a perfect matching. These are called matching covered graphs. I will just use the notation uh, MCG, matching covered graphs. So what are the properties? They are connected graphs and each edge is in some perfect matching. Okay. So we are going to restrict ourselves to matching covered graphs for the entire talk. And trust me that if you solve for these graphs, you solve for all graphs. Okay. Good. All right. So let me raise a few things here. So I want to go back to this idea that we had the triangular prism and we had these two triangles that we used to construct an appropriate vector, right? So now let's generalize this. Supposing I have a graph G. Uh -oh. Supposing I have a graph G with two vertex disjoint odd cycles. Q1 and Q2. Okay, so these are vertex disjoint odd cycles. Okay. Now their graph may have more vertices. This is the graph with the remaining vertices. Okay. Can I construct a vector that shows that the that shows that the vector satisfies the conditions, non-negativity and degree constraints, but is not in the polytope? So there's going to be an even number of vertices here, right? There's going to be some even number of vertices here. Is it possible to construct a vector from this much information that would allow me to show that the graph is not worth of one number? not immediately clear, right? Perhaps we know what to do with the odd cycles. That seems to be clear. But what do we do with the remaining vertices? How do we make sure that the remaining vertices also satisfies the negativity, non-negativity and degree constraints, especially the degree constraints? You just want a perfect matching to exist on those vertices? Great, great. So let's do that. Supposing we knew that there is a perfect matching in this remaining graph. So let us assume that this graph has a perfect matching. Okay, so has perfect matching. Okay, then how would we construct a vector? Then we could just put one half on the- One half on the? Other two cycles, odd cycles. Right, we put half on the odd cycles and we put what else on what else? Oh, one on this perfect matching. Exactly, great. So that's simple, right? We put half on the cycles and we put one on these edges and we put zero on all the other edges that are in the graph, right? That's straight, straightforward. Good. That is clearly in the, that clearly satisfies the constraints and that is not in the polytope because of the same reason as before. For the odd cycle, you have to use one of the edges going out of the odd cycle in any perfect matching. But in our case, we put zero on all of those edges, which I've not drawn. So that this vector is not in the polytope, right? Okay, so this turns out to be a sufficient condition for a graph to not be Birkhoff von Neumann. You want two vertex to an odd cycle, and you want the additional property that the remaining graph has a perfect matching when you delete the vertices of these odd cycles, right? Good. Turns out this is actually necessary and sufficient as was proved by Balas in 1981. Actually, I always thought that someone else had proved it uh, later, but then Cedric was the one who told me that Balas's 81 result already implies this. Okay. So Balas 1981 proved that this is necessary and sufficient for a graph to uh, 
not be Birkhoff von Neumann. Okay. So I want to write that down, but I want to use some terminology so that I can make things simpler later on. Okay, so let me introduce some terminology now. Let's erase stuff. Good. Okay, so I'm going to need two definitions. Well, one is very simple. It's a bicycle. A bicycle is just a pair of vertex disjoint cycles. Okay. A pair of vertex disjoint cycles. Okay. Now this property that Logan pointed out, pointed out the remaining graph having a perfect matching. That turns out to be a very important property in matching theory in general. It's called conformality. So from now on, a subgraph H of a graph G is conformal if G delete the vertices of H has a perfect matching. Okay. Good. So what we have here is a conformal bicycle where both the cycles happen to be of odd length. Right. This is the condition here. What we have here is an odd conformal bicycle. And by odd here, I mean both cycles are of odd length. So I should point out that because we are dealing with matching covered graphs, because we are dealing with matching covered graphs, a conformal bicycle, either both cycles will be odd or both cycles will be even. And I will call them an odd conformal bicycle or an even conformal bicycle. And what Balash's theorem says a graph G, a matching covered graph G, is not Birkhoff von Neumann. Work of von Neumann, if and only if G has an odd conformal bicycle. Okay. Everybody with me? Okay. So that's Balash's theorem, right? So now this makes it very clear that, um, that the problem is in Cohen P. I can easily convince someone that a graph is not Birkhoff von Neumann. Because I, I know that there is an odd conformal bicycle. So if I can find this, then I can convince the person it's a polytime certificate for the graph to not be Birkhoff von Neumann, right? What is not clear is it doesn't put the problem in NP. How do you convince someone that a graph does not have an odd conformal bicycle? So that one is open, right? So the problem is in co NP. It's not known to be in NP, and of course it is not known to be in P, right? Good. So very straightforward question, right? I mean, you are basically asking when is the perfect matching polytope characterized by non-negativity and degree constraints? And it turns out that we still don't know how to describe all of these graphs, or we still don't know how to recognize all of these graphs. So that's that. Okay, good. Um, I want to now switch to the second problem. Let me just take a look at the time here. Okay, good. We have we have room okay, I guess. Okay, so let's go back to the, uh, okay, I want to go to the second problem, but I need one definition for that. So what I need is the combinatorial diameter of a polytope. So some of you may know this, but if you don't, let's just define it. And I will draw the only polytope I can really draw. Not too very well, not too well anyways. Um, 
So that's the cube, right? That's the cube polytope. So given a polytope, you can define a graph from it. It's called the one skeleton of the polytope. What you do is you make each extreme point a vertex of your graph. So those are the zero dimensional faces, right? And you make each uh, edge of the polytope, you make it an edge of the graph. So those are the one dimensional hyperplanes, right? So if you do that to the cube polytope, you get the cube graph. Okay, so if this is my polytope P, then this is my one skeleton of the polytope P. Is the definition clear? Right? Okay. So the combinatorial diameter of a polytope is simply the graph theoretical diameter of the one skeleton of the polytope. What is the graph theoretical diameter? You look at the shortest distance, when you look at the shortest path length between any two vertices and you take the max over all pairs, right? So in this example, if you look at these two vertices, any path joining these two vertices has length at least three and you have paths of length three. So that means the graph theoretical diameter of this graph is equal to three, okay? So that's the definition of the combinatorial diameter of a polytope. Okay. So now you could ask the following question. Let's erase everything again. Now you can ask the following question. If I give you a graph G, then you can take the perfect matching polytope of this graph and you can ask, what is the combinatorial diameter of this polytope? Um, give me a second. I think there is something here which is making a noise. Okay. Good. All right, so given a graph G, you can take the perfect matching polytope and you could ask the very general question, compute the combinatorial diameter of the polytope of this graph. Okay, so compute the combinatorial diameter of the polytope. Turns out not much is known about this. We are going to ask a simpler question decide whether the combinatorial diameter of the polytope is equal to one or is it greater than one? Okay, that must be a simpler question. Turns out even this is open. We are not even able to recognize for what graphs the combinatorial diameter of the polytope is equal to one and for which one that is greater than one. Okay, so let me give you a quick example, an example that we are already familiar with. Here is a triangular prism so let's just have a graph G in this example. This graph has four perfect matchings as we discussed. So when you look at the perfect matching polytope of this graph, you're going to get a polytope with four extreme points. And when you take the one skeleton of this polytope, you can check that it is nothing but the graph K4. Okay, so this is a graph, which remember it's not Birkhoff von Neumann, but it is PM compact. So PM compact graphs are those graphs whose, for whom the combinatorial diameter of the perfect matching polytope of that graph is equal to one. Okay, so let's just write down the definition. A graph G is PM compact, that's the abbreviation, 
Uh, well, let me just put it here. We have compact. So I don't know why some cho somebody chose this name, but that is the name they chose. If the combinatorial diameter of the perfect matching polytope of the graph is equal to one. Okay. And so this graph, the triangular prism, is PM compact because the one skeleton is K4. In fact, uh, diameter being equal to one just means that the graph is a complete graph, right? So we are basically asking for which graphs is the one skeleton of the perfect matching polytope exactly a complete graph, right? Okay, so that's the next question we are asking. And uh, the problem is, so problem two, Characterize the PM compact matching covered graphs because, as usual, you don't need to worry about all graphs in the world. You can focus on good matching covered graphs. Okay. Good. So that's the second question. Again, the same problem. The recognition problem is it in NP? Is it in co NP? Is it NP? And it turns out that this problem has the same status as the previous problem. It's known to be in co-NP, but it's not known to be in NP and of course not known to be in P. Okay. So I want to now tell you about the co-NP characterization of these graphs, uh, which is going to be very similar to Balash's characterization. And you probably see where I'm going with this. Okay. So let's see. Okay, so this next characterization that I want to tell you about is uh, due to Quatal from 73. Seventy-three or seventy-five, anyways, one of those. Actually, I think it is seventy-five. Okay, so in this one, I won't give too much intuition as I did in the previous one, but I'll still give you a basic idea that makes it believable. So what are we trying to figure out? We are trying to figure out when are, when is the combinatorial diameter of the perfect matching polytope equal to one? Or in other words, when can we say for two extreme points or slightly differently, when can we say that for two extreme points of the polytope, of the perfect matching polytope, they are at distance one from each other, right? So these extreme points of the polytope, they correspond to perfect matchings of the original graph. So you would think intuitively that distance one between the extreme points should translate to something graph theoretical about the two perfect matchings, right? There must be something graph theoretical about the two perfect matchings, that is equivalent to saying that the extreme points are at distance one. So you have two perfect matchings. Well, what do you do when you have two perfect matchings in life? Anyone? Take their symmetric difference. Thank you. So when you have two perfect matchings, you take the symmetric difference. Thanks, Nathan. Right? So you look at the symmetric difference of these two perfect matchings. Well, that is going to be a bunch of even cycles, right? And we are, think, we are talking about the distance between the extreme points being equal to one. So maybe this has something to do with the number of even cycles you see in the symmetric difference. It would make sense because switching on the cycle moves from one perfect matching to the other perfect matching. And in the polytope, if you're running the simplex method, being at the two extreme points being adjacent means that the simplex method could go from one solution to the other in one step, right? I mean, this sort of makes sense geometrically. So it turns out this is exactly the same thing. Two extreme points are adjacent in the perfect matching polytope. If and only if the two perfect matchings, their symmetric difference contains exactly one cycle. You switch on this cycle, 
you move from the red perfect matching to the green perfect matching. Right. Okay, so this is exactly what Quartal proved rigorously, and it's not too difficult, and hopefully it makes intuitive sense. In fact, this can be used to argue that the the diameter is at least k or something, right? Like, exactly, it gives you an upper bound okay. on the diameter. Yeah. So, so for a matching covered graph G, the following are equivalent. The first statement is that the graph is not PM compact. The second statement is that the graph has two perfect matchings whose symmetric difference contains at least two cycles. Right? So G has two perfect matchings, M1 and M2, such that M1 symmetric difference M2 has at least two cycles. Right? Let's draw this. Let's, let's take a quick example, actually. Uh, in this example, actually, it's going to be very clear uh, what I want to demonstrate, but in general, it requires a short proof. So let's take this example here, the cube graph. And let me take two perfect matchings. The red one and the green one. Right? So you've got two perfect matchings of symmetric difference in this case is exactly two cycles. So this graph is not PM compact, right? Turns out this second condition is actually equivalent to saying that the graph G has an even conformal bicycle. Okay, it's not difficult to prove. You In this example, you just see the bicycle because there's no other vertices left. But in general, you could have more cycles and then it's very easy to get an even conformal bicycle from that, right? So you get two vertexes to an even cycle and the remaining graph just has a perfect match. So proving that these two are equivalent is really a simple homework exercise because your graph is matching covered. So that's very straightforward. Okay. So let's go back to Balash's result. Balash's result said, let's just write down Balash again. So Balash's result said that the graph is not Birkhoff von Neumann if and only if there exists an odd conformal bicycle. Okay, so you see the similarity between these two. Well, so both of these problems, uh, again, Quartal's result puts the problem in cohen P, but it's not at all clear how you would convince someone that the graph does not have an even conformal bicycle. So again, the problem is not known to be in NP. Right. Good. So the main difference between the two problems, as is now clear, is the parity of the conformal bicycle you are looking for. So we ask the following question. What if we forget about the parity? What if we ask a simpler question? Does the graph have a conformal bicycle or does it not have a conformal bicycle? Could that be easier? I mean, you would expect it to be easier, right? Because you're not imposing the parity constraint. So you're asking whether the graph has both the properties, Birkhoff von Neumann and PM compact, or does it not have one of the two properties, but then you don't care about which one it doesn't have. And turns out this is actually polytime solvable. These graphs, you can actually characterize them completely. And that is what I do for a living. I characterize the graphs completely. So there is no algorithm. It's really a complete characterization. Of graphs. Okay. So I'll tell you about that next. Okay. So let's clear everything. And so here is the main theorem. This is joint work with Carvalho. Wang and Lin, and it's accepted for publication in Sigma, but not yet appeared. 
because it takes forever to appear. Anyways, so, so the result says you have a matching covered graph G. The following are equivalent. The first condition, well, the first statement is the graph is Birkhoff von Neumann as well as PM compact. So it has both the properties, not just one of them, it has both of these properties. And that is equivalent to saying that the graph has no conformal bicycle. Okay. So this is nothing new, right? This is just regurgitating what Balash and Quattal did. So what is new is number three. Okay. So I'd like to tell you this new thing. Um, but let me just take a quick look at the time. Okay, so we have some 14 minutes. Are there any questions at this point? Any comments? No? Okay. So I want to tell you the description of these graphs, which is the last part. But for that, I need some definitions. Okay. In fact, I basically need one definition. So supposing I have a graph with a vertex of degree two. Well, when I have a vertex of degree two, what I could do is I could contract the two edges incident with that vertex. We call this the bicontraction of that vertex, right? So I will bicontract the vertex V and that will give me a graph with two fewer vertices. Okay. Turns out this graph is matching covered if and only if this graph is matching covered. You can do the splitting in the other direction, but then let's not worry about the if and only if. I think the important part here is really one direction. So let's just focus on what is important. Um, The graph is matching covered implies that when you bicontract the vertex of degree two, the resulting graph is matching covered. If there is a conformal bicycle in this graph, supposing I have a conformal bicycle in this graph. In fact, if I have an odd conformal bicycle, then it will translate easily to an odd conformal bicycle in this graph. Okay. And vice versa. These, fact, these things are actually if and only if. So if I have an in, even conformal bicycle, I'll get an even conformal bicycle in the uh, graph after my contracting the vertex. Okay. So all of the things I care about, matching covered, work of one moment, PM compact, all of these properties are preserved by by contraction of a vertex. Okay. So I can by contract a vertex. I can have another vertex of degree two. I'll by contract it. I'll keep doing this. Now you might ask one question. What if there are multiple edges? So well, I lied to you in the beginning or I never talked about it, all the graphs in this talk are allowed to have multiple edges. In general, in matching theory, you allow multiple edges. Because if an edge is in a perfect matching, then all the multiple edges parallel to that edge are also in a perfect matching, okay? But you never allow loops, okay? So if there are multiple edges, keep them, don't throw them away. Just keep by contracting degree two vertices until there are no degree two vertices left in your graph, okay? So the resulting graph you will get will be a matching covered graph with minimum degree three because you bicontracted all the vertices of degree two. Okay. So we're going to talk about this graph. This is called the retract of the original graph. Okay. So if my graph is G and I keep doing this operation repeatedly, then the resulting graph is called the retract of G, right? So I'm not just doing one by contraction. I could be doing tens of them. Good. And the retract will be matching covered and it will have all of the properties that the original graph had for von Neumann, PM compact namely. Okay. Good. And the retract is unique. No matter what sequence you do the contractions in, it doesn't uh, change the result you get. Okay. So the retract is defined uniquely for a given graph. Okay. So our last result says that uh, the retract of the graph has to be in the following list of graphs. So the retract of G 
belongs to the following list of graphs. Okay, now I want to just tell you the list of graphs. So the first graph is K2 with multiple edges. To give you an example, if you do the bi-contraction on this ladder graph, you will get K2. So actually you could have many complicated graphs, but if you just keep doing bi-contraction, you might just get K2 with multiple edges. Okay. So that is what the star means. I'm allowing multiple edges. Okay. The second graph is K33. Here you cannot allow multiple edges because if you put a multiple edge in K33, you get a two cycle and a four cycle. The graph is not TM compact. Okay. The third graph is K4. In K4, you have to be slightly careful. You could put a multiple edge here, but if you put a multiple edge here, you can no longer put a multiple edge here because then you get two two cycles and that graph is not TM compact. Okay. So when you do the retract, you may get K4 with multiple edges. So long as that graph does not have these two vertex disjoint cycles. Right? So you can allow all of the multiple edges, but you can't allow both of these at the same time. Okay. The next one is an infinite family, odd wheels. So odd wheels are going to be beyond K4. So let me give you an example. Actually, let me erase all of this. So the odd wheels are going to be at least six vertices and I could have multiple edges so long as all the multiple edges are spokes of the graph. I can never put a multiple edge anywhere else. It's only the spokes. Okay. If you put a multiple edge anywhere else, you can find two disjoint cycles of the right parity, whatever. Okay. So you will, so it's, odd wheels with multiple edges where the multiplicity is only restricted to spokes. And here K is at least two. Okay, so it's, uh, the cycle is length at least five. Okay, good. The next graph is, um, what you do is you basically combine these two graphs. You take a K33 and you replace one vertex by a triangle. And so that is going to be this graph. Okay. So this is what we call K4 spliced with K33. Here, you may not add any multiple edges. And there is the last graph, which is a variant of the previous graph. What you do is you draw the previous graph. And you join the two vertices here. And here you may add any, any number of multiple edges. So all the multiple edges have to be joining these two vertices. You can add as many multiple edges and your graph will remain Birkhoff von Neumann and TM compact, right? So this is called the Murthy graph because Professor Murthy found it in a certain context in 2002. Okay, and all the multiple edges have to be between these two vertices. Okay, so let's just go back. So we are taking the retract of the graph. So your graph could have, I don't know, a thousand vertices, but you keep taking the retract. And once you have the retract, your resulting graph has to be in this list. So there are five graphs with multiple edges allowed in various ways and one infinite family, which is the odd wheels. And these are all of the graphs that have both the properties, right? So if your graph is not here, then either there is an odd conformal bicycle or there is an even conformal bicycle, but I cannot tell you which one it is. Okay. So I think, I don't think there is any time to really go over the other results. So I'm just going to skip the other result. And I already talked about it in Waterloo in 2017. So it's okay. 
Thank you. Questions for Nishad? I guess I have a few questions. So, um, in these BVN, uh, Berkhoff von Neumann, uh, plus uh, PMC graphs, um, yeah. do you know how many perfect matchings these graphs can have? Can they have an exponential number uh, where the ex exponential and n, the number of vertices? Mm. Right, okay, let's see. Um, well, so if you allow lots of multiple edges, then it seems that you could technically keep the number of vertices constant and have lots of perfect matching, right? Oh, sorry, uh, yeah, I guess I want to assume that G is simple as well. Oh, okay. Okay, so you're assuming that the original graph is simple. Yeah. Right, but the problem is, well, maybe you are going to assume that the retract is simple, but if you assume just the original graph is simple, the retract could still have multiple edges, right? Correct, correct. Right. Uh, right, okay. Let's see. Uh, so all of these graphs that we have drawn here, if you just look at the graphs that are there here drawn, then I think the number of perfect matchings is can can be exponential only because of multiple edges, right? Because otherwise it's just a fixed number of perfect matchings. Right. So unless and until I allow multiple edges, I won't have more perfect matchings in these retracts. But the point is that even if the retract has multiple edges, the original graph might be simple. Yes. So it's not entirely clear. Uh, yeah, I don't really have an answer. I, I'll have to think more about it. Cool, Th thanks. Because I was thinking uh, like with these PMC graphs, um, if they do have a polynomial number of matchings perfect matchings then maybe this is like some avenue for pursuing like a uh, polynomial time algorithm or something where if if you could just find the perfect like just brute force all the all the perfect matchings provided you have a polynomial time routine for generating those and then you just pairwise try all the perfect matchings and see if they have a uh, i see a simple cycle. So, in, so if we know somehow, let's suppose we know that the PM compact graphs have a polynomial number of perfect matchings. Yeah. Um, okay. But then we would the still start to enumerate the number of perfect matchings. Yes. Yeah. So provided you have some routine for generating those, uh, like where you have polynomial time per each um, new perfect matching that you generate. They have, uh, like the computer scientists have uh, studied a lot of these enumeration problems and, and they're, they're pretty good at, at like outputting um, combinatorial objects with like polynomial time overhead for each new um, output that's generated. But, you know, most of the time you have an exponential number of these um, things that you're enumerating. But it seems to me that maybe these PMC graphs, uh, are, they have, they might have a special structure to where um, you like that they can't have too many perfect matchings. Right, right. I see. Yeah, that. Um, I haven't really thought in that direction. Yeah. I I do think that in general the problem should be polytime solvable. Mm -hmm. um, by hook or by crook, but I think it should be polytime solvable. Yeah. I guess I I have one more question too. Yeah. So um. Right. So the one skeleton of the perfect matching polytope of like, let's say the, com the complete graph, you can choose bipartite or not. Um, those polytopes have like a really, really nice property. So, um, so in particular, um, they like in algebraic graph theory, you call these things like Cayley graphs or something where like there's this natural, like if you let the, if you let a group act on it, like the symmetric group, then, uh, it leaves the graph, the one skeleton unchanged. 
and which makes sense because if you look at all the perfect matchings of like say the complete bipartite graph on where both sides have n parts or like the complete uh, graph on an even number of vertices then like it's there's there's so many of them that they uh, like it, you, you have this nice sort of symmetry whenever you let a group act on them in like uh, the natural way where like you perm permute the vertices or whatever. So uh, an interesting design question that's related to some of the things you're talking about or is the following. So uh, can you can you give it a lower bound on the clique number of the one skeleton of the complete graph? Uh, the, the the one skeleton of the uh, the perfect matching polytope of the complete graph. So so how large can these cliques be? So in other words, I want a collection of perfect matchings of let's just say uh, of, of of the uh, complete bipartite graph, such that uh, when I take the symmetric difference of any two, I always get a single cycle. Mm. So the question is like, how large can this clique be? I see. So you're starting from a complete graph, then you're taking the perfect matching polytope, and then it's one skeleton. And in this one skeleton, you're asking the clique number. Yes, exactly. And so, the, as far as I so, so this came up in in uh, in some work that I've been doing, and and uh, I I really can't find anything on like as for like lower bounds, um, but it seems like you could consider like a, a perfect a compact like let's just assume bipartite right now. So so like these. Like bipartite graphs are a subclass of uh, Birkhoff von Neumann graphs. Yeah. Uh, I guess that, yeah. So, so, so just consider bipartite graphs. Can you, um, right. Um, so you can think of a, you can look at a Birkhoff von Neumann's, uh, any subgraph of the complete graph, and then you can consider like, okay, what are the perfect matchings on this subgraph? Right. Uh, and so if your sub if the subgraph is uh, is PMC, mm -hmm. then uh, you know that uh, if you collect all those perfect matchings on just that subgraph, then you get um, you're right. going to get a clique. Right. And so th th that's another reason why I'm, I'm sort of interested in uh, like how many perfect matchings can these um, PMC graphs like how many matchings like do they have perfect matchings can, can they have right interesting yeah i just thought i'd share those two uh, it, it's uh I, I always feel like you're we're the the yin and yang of perfect matchings in, in our generation of uh, waterloo students <laughs> like you, you do the structural stuff i do the algebraic stuff <laughs> and i think that finally there's like a chance where like we uh we can meet in the middle somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I, I intend to look at your thesis. Joseph did share it with me. So, oh, yeah. So <laughs> the only thing I can think about saying at this point related to your question is I think so. I'm, I'm pretty sure you've already come across this. So, I think the diameter of the perfect matching polytope for complete graphs is known, right? That's like two or something. Yeah, two. It's for your, uh, uh, Right. Yeah, for sufficiently large, uh, I think n greater than four or something like that. I can't oh, I remember. see. Okay. Yeah, I, I just remember coming across that. So that's the only thing I can really think of right now. But it doesn't yeah. really tell you anything about the largest clique. It just gives you the bound on the diameter. Right, right. Right. I see. Yeah, that would be very interesting to find out. Yeah. Do let me know if you have any progress. Oh, I'll certainly let you know. Yeah, yeah. I see. Any other questions? Uh, I had a quick question. So Nishad, like how do the how does the proof go? Uh, I see. Well, so the proof is um okay, so um so that the most difficult part of the proof is to prove it for this class of graphs called bricks. Okay. So I won't define it right now, but I'll just tell you the bricks that are drawn here. So the only bricks that we have drawn here are the K4, uh, the odd wheels, and this particular graph here. Okay, so these are all the bricks. So the one of the main theorems we first proved, or we actually proved it at the end because I wrote the paper in a nonlinear fashion. So we proved at the end, end that uh, the only bricks that have both of these properties uh, Birkhoff von Neumann and PM compact are K4 odd wheels and the Murthy graph. 
And to prove that, we basically use the um, induction tools for bricks that were in, uh, invented by or discovered by Norin and Thomas. So it basically gives you, it's similar to Tut's theorem. So Tut says that, you know, for a three connect, you want to generate all the three connected graphs, you start from the wheels. You can always add an edge or you can take a high degree vertex and split it. So in a similar sense, you have operations for bricks. You either add an edge or you do some kind of splitting operations. And using these operations, you can generate all the bricks starting from a certain list of infinite families. Right? So, you know, so this basically gives you a basis of doing induction on bricks. You just apply Noreen Thomas, and this is basically what I did in half of my thesis. Take Noreen Thomas and hammer it on these problems, and you get all the bricks that have these properties. Okay. So that's how you get the list of bricks. Once you have the list of bricks, getting the list of matching covered graphs is not so difficult. It's very standard techniques where basically you know that all matching covered graphs, they are com they comprise of bricks and braces. So it's again an induction proof. The base case is bricks. And then you know that the other graphs are constructed from the bricks and braces. Bricks are non-bipartite, braces are bipartite. So you use that standard tight cut decomposition induction tools to get the list of all matching code graphs. And in fact, that was one of my main contributions because before I joined the project, my co-authors already had the brick part. But the thing is, the brick part doesn't sell. If you want to sell, you need to sell the problem for all graphs in the world. Nobody cares about bricks except me and some other people. So I was like, okay, you know what? Bricks is not good enough. Let's take it to matching covered graphs. And it turns out that it's just some four pages. You can extend from bricks to matching covered graphs, and then you can actually sell the result much more easily. So yeah, I don't know if that does that answer your question. But like, I, I, yes, yeah. I just wanted okay. to know, like, so there is some like very technical work that happens right, in the background, right. but so the algorithm is very simple. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you use the induction machinery for bricks by Noreen and Thomas, and then you use a standard matching theory machinery, tight cuts developed by Lovas, Plummer, and all for going from bricks to all matching code. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. You're welcome. Other questions? Um, Do you think uh, those problems are co-MP complete or are they in P? I think you said P. I think they are both in P. Both. Okay. I think there is a, well, there might be various ways of approaching it. My way of approaching it is, of course, a very structural graph theory approach. Is you basically just characterize the whole class of graphs, and then you know that it is in P. So I, that is the kind of stuff I'm looking for, looking for a structural characterization of these graphs. And if you want to see uh, something similar, so I think the result, whatever the result is, the final you know, result, it's going to be something similar to what happened in the case of uh, Fafian bipartite graphs. So there are these papers by Robertson, Seymour Thomas, mm -hmm. and by William McQuaig, um, who used to be in Victoria before. So there are these papers in around 1999, 2000, where they characterize all Fafian bipartite graphs. And I think the result in both of these cases, especially Burkhoff von Neumann, is going to be somewhat similar to that. Okay. Makes sense. At least some special cases should be solvable. So maybe I should take this opportunity to mention some special cases that have been solved. So in the case of Burkhoff von Neumann, uh, the planar case has been solved. This was actually solved in 2006 by Carvalho Lucchesi Murthy. And uh, what else has been solved? Planar is solved. I think that is it. And in the case of PM Compact, the bipartite case has been solved, which was again, I think, uh, I think it was some Chinese authors. And then they also solved the bipartite and near bipartite case. Uh, two of my collaborators from China and some three, four other authors from Brazil and India. So both of these are the special cases that have been solved. One very interesting special case that remains is the near bipartite case. So I won't define near bipartite, but the idea is you remove two edges and the graph becomes bipartite. And there is the reason why you remove two edges and not just one. Um, so near bipartite Burkhoff von Neumann would be a very interesting special case to solve. And I'm, I can assure you that it won't be easy, but at the same time, it will be significantly easier than the general problem. So that, that is somewhere where I really have some hopes. So you, 
why can't you use the splitter type theorem of Noreen and Thomas? And uh, for the L bipartite? No, just even just, well, or that for that, or just in general. I mean, you, you said right. this proof kind so, of both. Yeah, so using the splitter theorem of Noreen and Thomas, uh, you run into some difficulties when your graph is not planar. Uh, it's really hard to find these structures, you know, finding this odd conformal bicycle. So actually, since you mentioned this, we use the Noreen Thomas splitter theorem in another paper where we proved that Birkhoff von Neumann graph, which is the second result I was going to talk about. Uh, we proved that Birkhoff von Neumann is equivalent to another class of graphs called prism free graphs. So to prove this equivalence, uh, we use the splitter theorem. But unfortunately, when you try to use a splitter theorem, to get the exact list of graphs, you run into some difficulties. Uh, it's very hard to find the odd conformal bicycle or the prism or K4, whatever structure you're looking for. Um, but it would be it would be great. I mean, I, I haven't given up on it. I just think that we need some more information about the structure of these graphs in order to apply the splitter theorem and find the bicycle. You know, you need to find the bicycle in order to make progress. And it's not clear how you do that. Yeah. Uh, also, on the nearby product case, I, I introduced splitter theorems in my own thesis, uh, but I was not able to use them to actually prove anything. So it's, a, it's, a, it's stuff, very technical stuff that has not so far led to anything really interesting for the community. <laughs> Thanks. Also, I feel like I remember on archive seeing that the Noreen Thomas paper got updated because there was an error. Were you the one who fixed the error? <laughs> yeah, so that was, uh, so they used the, they had the splitter theorem paper and they, that was to generate bricks. And then they proved another result using that one for generating minimal bricks. By minimal, they mean if you remove any edge, the graph is no longer a brick. Uh, but in that, in doing so, they, there was a thing they overlooked. And we wrote a similar paper on minimal braces and we found the error. And so we pointed it out to them and they updated that paper. But yeah, it was a minor error and it was the, let's say the lesser important paper, um, not, the, not the main BRICS generation paper, it was the other one. Which I'm glad about because I used the other results in my thesis. So if there's a gap in the previous one, then part of my thesis could be wrong. <laughs> that would be unfortunate. Uh, any other questions? Right. Uh, so let's thank Nishad again uh, for presenting this beautiful result. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh,